Present. Is it Present. 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 Present.
Tim uh, and Eli, and he's here to answer any questions that you may have. Good evening, Mr. Paulson. Good evening. So for whatever reason, they had two, you know, letter, letters of credit to cover their improvements. So um, our letter just details the amount to be reduced from each letter and the amount remaining. And the attached spreadsheet uh, from the uh, developer's engineer. Does anyone have any questions about the information presented to you about the letter of credit reduction? Okay. Uh, just to make sure, Mr. Paulson, that I'm reading this correctly. In the letter of credit reduction request number one, which is a part of the memorandum, it states that the uh, note that the values of the letters of credit for each completed item will be reduced by 90% with 10% of the value remaining in the letter of credit. When Correct. I look at how much is remaining, we're going from 2.1 million to 486,000 and 1 million to 964. So I know that's not the 90 10. When I look at the itemized supporting documents on the items that are shown as completed, those are reduced at 100% and only the outstanding outstanding items are still left full. So where's the 90 10 coming from? So that's on, yeah, for the completed items. And he did his spreadsheet a little differently. If you look at his, his summary uh, page, um, he when he does his new balance he's adding back in a 10 percent of everything that of the cost that he um is requesting um is it that he's calling complete and then you can see his new balance letter of credit 125 percent cost to complete plus 10 percent of the completed improvements the very last page Good. The last two pages are the you know the summary. So he he added it back in. It's a little less clear of a way than the the engineer for the school district did it last month, but it does uh, give the correct uh, dollar amount. Any questions? It doesn't seem like 90%. When we look at those numbers on page 13, 2.132 million and 1.892 million. Oh, it's 10% of 4 million. 400,000. Oh, yeah, they extended it. Yes, it's familiar. All the way to um, Kelly. Yeah, that, I'm not getting numbers that add up. So what you're saying is, if I'm reading this correct, it's the 238,000 cost of complete improvements with an extra 25 percent saving of 125 percent, plus the small 180, 189,900 and. For four hundred ninety-nine dollars, which is ten percent of the one point eight million, is that accurate? Correct. Okay. So, so that's the four eighty-six. Where's the nine sixty-four? Next page. Next page. Exactly. All right, thank you. Can you double check it just so that we feel a little bit better? Because it doesn't. It, it's not comprehending really easily, and it doesn't seem like it's 90. Yeah, it's not. I mean, he didn't. It's not a well, it's not clear as it was last time. So it's the uh, say so if you're looking at sheet, um, just to clarify, if you're looking at I, yeah, page 13, you have uh, 10 percent of the one million eight ninety four nine sixty six fifty. 
that is the value of the completed improvements plus 125% of the 238,000, which is the uh, improvements left to complete, and that equals the 486, uh, 998. But I can uh, I can uh, check the numbers again and send Jay, you know, a confirmation email tomorrow. When we do a letter of credit, or they, they take out this letter of credit, is it taken out at a value of 125% of what the estimated cost for all of the work is? Yes. Okay. All right. So that's why the 125% of, of non-finished work is in there. Correct. Okay. And we can just public improvements. Yeah. And I, I did have to check and get our notes. Okay. Same. Do we have any other questions? Just one other, and it's not to do with the numbers, but it made me think about it on page nine when we were doing water main improvements. I just wanted to make sure that we were that we were making sure that they weren't doing the same thing that happened up in Lakewood with those half cul-de-sacs where everything was connected with the water from one main in the center of the cul-de-sac. They don't have uh, they, they do not have those type of of bends. Out there, they don't have those type of cul de sacs either. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. So Maybe think no. of it. Okay, no. thank you very much. And, and EDI is signed off on all of this work as complete, which with passing full inspection. Correct. And we've okay. done a we've done a punch list inspection, which they'll you know address weather permitting. So as I mentioned last time, this isn't yet acceptance of public improvements; it's just reduction of the letter of credit. This will come back to you at some point after all the punch list items. Uh, everything is completed uh, for acceptance of the improvements. OK, I will entertain a motion to approve the uh, to approve the two letters of credit reductions for public improvements in Prairie Ridge neighborhoods, KLNM. So second. Questions or comments? Mr. Clerk, can you call the roll? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Matt. Aye. Ms. Palestini. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. Ms. Voting. Aye. Motion passed to zero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now we would ask for your consideration of an ordinance amending the fee for registration of video gaming terminals, increasing the fee from $25 to $250, effective January 1st, 2023. Uh, we had discussion at the last board meeting about this item. And uh, I would defer to Trustee Kelly to give you an update uh, on his discussion with the BBC last week. So as, as uh, we discussed at the board, I took this to the BBC to have a discussion on the, the increase of fees. There was a, a very good discussion around the topic. Um, and uh, I would say at the end, the consensus of the, the BBC was in agreement with the, the village board to, to uh, recommend the $250 full increase on the, on the gaming fees. And so that was the strategy you said consensus of yeah. the I would say it was unanimous. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? We kind of beat it to death the last meeting, but I think we can certainly talk about it again. Um, if there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve ordinance 22-01 amendment <coughs> for registration uh, registration of video terminals uh, from 25 to 200. So we'll just one absolutely just one clarification question, simple. When it first came, the legislation first came up, was the maximum we could do $25? Yeah. Yeah. So that was the max. And now yeah. this is the new max. And they just, they, what was that, October or something like that? Did they change it? October, November? Mm -hmm. well, well, when they signed the legislation, it's December. It's signed right, right yeah. before the end of the year, so yeah. we can't have time to do it before January yeah. 1st. Okay. I was yeah. just trying to make sure but it wasn't 100 and we went 25. And Okay. In fact, the other thing the legislation does is prohibit any other type of taxes. For example, there was a push tax that Evanston is in litigation about. I uh, get one other community, maybe Chicago. Um, so they're they're trying to stop any other type of taxes on on video games. Thank you. Okay, so we have a first and a second. Are there any other questions? Mr. Clerk, can you call the roll? Mr. Cole. Aye. Okay. Mr. Matt. Aye. Ms. Palestini. Aye. Mr. Evanson? Aye. Ms. Bowden? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Motion passed to zero. Oh, the next thing I'd just like to give you a quick update on Streetscape. Uh, we've been meeting the last couple of weeks with EEI, uh, discussing the scope of, street, of uh, the Streetscape project. They've gone out and, 
and tested the market for material costs and labor costs. Um, what we've done is we've, we've kept the scope essentially the same. We have changed some of the materials. So some of the original brick pavers that you all saw laying in this room almost a year ago now, six months ago, um, a lot of those will now be stamped um, pavers instead of the real pavers, a lot less material costs and also a lot less labor. Um, one of the things we've done is we've We've separated out the overhead light, candelaria light system. It's really a nice canopy. It's really, really gives us a really good feel. That's now being bid as an alternate in case the, price, the costs come in so high that we can't afford to do that. So this, this time around, uh, the engineer's estimate uh, for the base bid is $850,000, which when you add our engineering costs and, and the landscape architecture costs that we've already incurred, that puts us at our million $30,000 limit. Uh, in addition to that, there are two alternates. One is the type of pavers that we use, two different options. And then the other major option is uh, what we estimated about $120,000 is the cantillary light system. So it's very possible that we may have to scale back. We have not cut back any infrastructure. So that I want to remind the board of your direction. Those of you who were on the board then, uh, the direction was that we don't want to camp at all in the infrastructure. Let's do it right. Um, and then let's do as much as we can on the surface to make it look nice. So that all the infrastructure is in, with one minor exception, we had a storm sewer going in at uh, Rin that was headed to a park. Uh, we all are aware that we have a, a stormwater issue at Park and Rin. Until we actually fix that problem and that challenge, which we now have some engineering estimates on, we'll talk about our capital budget. There's really no point in directing more water towards Rin, or excuse me, towards Park. So we took that out, that eliminated about $40,000. Um, so material costs are still very high, however. So uh, this, the scope will be similar, but it's very possible that we won't be able to do the candelaria light system um, and, and some of the materials will be less, but it, it will still be very attractive and we'll, we'll certainly um, get our infrastructure repaired. We have not gone to the, the extent yet of, so the festival block will still have the two nice intersections uh, with crosswalks and all in the stamp pavers. So that the landscape, the bulb outs, I think I mentioned once before, maybe not. Um, previously, we had some very decorative bulb bollards, they call them. And, and I remember the term that we gave to pedestrians, the, the sense of security, sense of safety. Um, and we talked about that a little more. Um, Kurt from EEI said, yeah, there, so we could put steel bollards in there that would really give you real safety and they'd be a lot less expensive. So we just made that change. It saved us uh, about $15,000. And now we have real safety instead of just decorative. So I thought that was a pretty obvious change to make. Um, so this time around, we'll see what, how the bids come in. Uh, I believe the EEI typically is high under engineer's estimate. Uh, and by the way, the engineer's estimate does not go to the bidders, so they know what our target pricing is. Um, but we have an idea what we expect it to be. And uh, so we'll, we'll have some options once we receive those bids and bring them back to you on how much we think we can do in the project. And the bids will go out next week. I believe they're due back on, on uh, February, February 4th. Uh, while I'm on the topic, I'll just remind you that next uh, Wednesday, we're opening bids for this the uh, North-South Water Connection. And that engineer's estimate, um, I, I won't mention that now publicly because it's uh, still up for bid, but the engineer's estimate is, is lower than our budget price. So we're optimistic that that project will come in at a price that we can afford and we have the funding available for it now. So if there's any question about streetscape or the water connection, I can answer this. When do you think we're going to break ground? I mean, what month at least? On streetscape? Yeah. Well, one of the things we talked about um, this time around is giving the contractor a little more flexibility. Uh, what we did last time, we did everything wrong because of the timing. We bid it in May. Contractors were really busy working. Uh, and then we gave them a very short window to try and get done by Labor Day. Um, and that, we think that that probably cost cause the prices to be higher, the cost to be higher. So in this in this instance, we're giving them 16 weeks to complete the work uh, once they start. So we expect that the, that the contractor will get started right away in the spring, but they should be able to. But they'll have some flexibility, maybe a six or eight week window when they start and when they finish. We just are limiting the time that the street can be torn up to 16 weeks, so it doesn't, it doesn't really inconvenience our business anymore than necessary. Okay. Okay, if there are no more questions about that, we'll move right into uh, December financial reports. Lines? Yep, what about the... Oh, sorry. Oh, 
okay. Um, so uh, in your packet this evening, you have the December financial report. Um, I won't go over it in detail other than just to highlight a couple of things for you. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about leveling the playing field for um, Illinois sales tax. So I did um, do a little bit more of a more thorough description of that um, in the agenda supplement. And so when we combine sales and use tax, which we're going to kind of look at together in the aggregate, we're at 84 percent of our budgeted revenue. So I still feel um, you know, good about that, even though it's not necessarily in the categories that I had um, had projected. Um, nothing really super unusual um, on the revenue or expense side. Um, we, we did um, receive eight uh, new home, or sorry, didn't receive. We issued eight new home permits um, during the month of December, which is odd actually in having those come in in the winter time. Mm -hmm. However, with Lennar starting um, their project at Cam's Farm, um, there's been some, you know, some real movement in that subdivision. If you haven't been up there, you really need to drop by. Um, so we're at uh, 28 new home permits for the year. Um, still optimistic that, you know, we'll get some um, permits in in the spring and get those um, issued. So hoping to make a budget on that. Um, as far as water and sewer, all of their stuff is uh, pretty pretty normal and um, on track, other than the things that we previously discussed, such as the sewer gasoline expense, which is just going to be over this year. Um, and then I'll entertain any questions you might have. I just have one bit. I know we've talked about this in the way MSI is. Yes. Can I look at, uh, I should tell you a page. Sure. Page 20. Okay. And it's the budget versus actual report overview for general fund. Okay. Are we really in a surplus of 986,000 or is this an MSI accounting thing? So, um, again, I do not um, budget. Um, how do I want to put this? Um, yeah, I, I don't do the seasonality of our right. budget. You do the so. even 12 months. So that's exactly. what that represents. That so is, maybe yes. a big expenditure coming. There yeah, and, and the big expenditure, I mean, we have all the revenue from property tax at this point, you know, over a million dollars. And we have yeah. not, I have not done the transfer yet to the police pension fund. Okay. So, so there you go. <laughs> okay. So, That's yeah. what I thought, but just yeah. if anybody were to see this and look yeah. at it. And yeah, yeah. Well, let's go out and spend a lot of money. No, well, you, if not, the community not. sees it, and if we're talking about revenue in other areas, they could wonder, well, we have almost a million extra that budget. In actuality, that's not kind of where we really are at. That's accurate. Okay. Now that we're caught up and we're doing like six months, like more than six months, I think, of re regular reporting, we're going to start working on some graphics and some other things. I think that will give you a little more visual view. In fact, I have some graphics that I'm going to share with you. And, right. and that was my assumption. This isn't that this is the, uh, the wrong way to do it. I just, should somebody see this, it's good to know that there are some big expenditures. Yes. Coming, but it won't be that healthy. That's it. So what I hear you saying is changing the fiscal year to advance the calendar year would stop this problem? Oh, no, I didn't say anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've ever mentioned that before. Actually, I've never heard that before. <laughs> Ms. Lines, I just have one quick question. And just, just something that jumped out at me on page 17 in your, in your kind of description. Sure. You said the number of real retailers reporting Hampshire sales went from 200 to 1,100. Yeah, so that, that shows that um, um, before, like, I would buy pet food from Chewy. And I would have to report that on my Illinois um, income tax return as use tax because Chewy didn't have a physical location in Illinois and I was not charged sales tax. Okay. Nowadays, um, this level the playing field makes Chewy report to the village. So no longer is it in my use tax as a single line item. It's now included, and Chewy might not exactly be the exact, you know, but it's a good example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, now we have over 1,100 retailers that are reporting Hampshire sales. Okay. Yep. Okay. So online sales might be driving quite a number of them. Absolutely, okay. yes. And that's what's causing the flip between use tax and sales tax. Got okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. You're welcome. Awesome work as always. Thank you. Steve. Oh. Good evening, Ms. Lyons. 
in front of you, we have the incident uh, summary report for the police department during the uh, month of December. Notably, when I glance at it, I notice our domestics are up again for uh, probably about the third month. Uh, assist Clean County is, is quite high. I would attribute that to the accidents that are in the area. Our speeding tickets are really high, so the guys are going out there and finding them, even in this uh, the weather. Uh, stop signs are uh, enforcement is, is doing very well, along with the uh, uh, reduction in our parking tickets. I think everybody's finally understanding that you can't park on the street. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. We'll get it Mr. Paul, uh, engineer. Yes, sir. 12, 12 uh, ordinance violations. Yes. Do, do, do are those? Uh, those are notifications for cars, uh, junk cars, <coughs> uh, junk that may be sitting outside that's in, in violation. Does that, does that include the high school complaint? The high school. Problems at the high school, there are OB cases? No. I think that does reflect a, a little more um, enforcement of our codes. I like the parking tickets. Keith, quick question for you. I, this had been posted on social media. I can I can say that I had seen it on my camera. There is evidently individuals going around pretending to be or saying they were from ComEd to sign people up for solar. How how would somebody report that? Or that is the proper procedure. 911. 911 is the proper procedure. Yes, that's the only way to do it. That goes right to our dispatch, and that is the proper procedure. You okay. don't call the office. Don't get on Facebook. Call us. Okay. Like call 911 on that type of a... Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. Chief, I have a question, too. I just... I wanted, I see it several places now where people are actually parking on their lawns um, because of the parking by you know, the, the limit now. So all of a sudden I'll see someone and they're kind of on the apron area or they're on their front lawn. We're kind of in the middle of deciding what I think the board wants to do as far as parking on hard surfaces. And we kind of backed off on that kind of parking uh, enforcement. This is um, on the lawn. I mean, right. literally up the curb right. and there there was a one on Jefferson. Are you speaking of that one? East Jefferson? Okay. Yeah. Um, Parking on the lawn is a clear violation. Right. So Let me sense. know what you're seeing and yeah. where you're seeing it. But I know a little bit off the side of the road we're not messing with right now until we get further clarification. These are on the parkway. And, and you know, are it's they like, over the curb? Oh, yeah, certain? it's okay. like literally up the driveway to get around the curb and then parking, you know, okay. across yeah, no, parallel that's... with the street. Okay. Well, you can park that way on the apron, can you not? No, this is on the lawn. Okay. Right on the lawn. <laughs> no, but on the hard, on the apron. Yeah. So, yes. So if you were going parallel with the street, a lot of them are doing that, right? Yeah. Keeping the sidewalk open. I was going to say, I'd be guilty that. of that. Right. right. And that's fine. I just, I, you know, I've seen it, and I don't remember if it was Jefferson, but there was another one. I know I've seen it on the lawn. Okay. Uh, but it's been in a couple water. different places, and not where there's no curb. It's where there's mm -hmm. curbs. Okay. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me, and okay. I'll be happy to. Uh, I, wanna, I mean, I'm not looking to turn someone in. I just wanted to know if that was no, actually that, you were seeing. No, that is illegal. It. According well, to the one my favorite garbage cans in the street, like not not like because they were blown here. But a lot of people are having an, a, a narrow. Uh, obviously, the apron into their driveway. They are putting them out on the street, and we're going to have an issue. I mean, at some point, we're going have to be that, Mr. every mm -hmm. time. Hmm. You know, at some point, we're going to have to come up with a procedure where we're going to get out of the car and start, you know, either knocking on doors and the there's, middle of the there's night. specific pockets of this village where there's it seems to be a neighborhood where neighborhoods they see one neighbor do it, and whenever I know Lakewood's really bad, and I think that there's there's some other. Pockets of Tuscany Woods that are pretty bad. Okay. Just, and then I think over on uh, over in Old Manor, there's a couple of streets that are pretty decent about it. But they instead of putting their garbage cart in the lawn or side lot, you know, side lawn or something like that next to their driveway or at the end of their driveway, they put it out in the street. And I've been seeing it more and more and more. Right. There's no reason they can't put it in the apron. Right? No. A lot of times now when the snow is going to be start to be piling up, I kind of get that. But right now there's, you know, obviously no reason. And I feel for these guys because they have to give a wide berth of it. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Well, then people end up complaining that the street's not clear curb to curb, but that there's obstructions. Right. You know, might help we can post on our uh, social media and maybe yeah. put something on our next newsletter. Highlight some ordinances. Is this right? Is it in? I mean, some of the neighborhoods. Is it in neighborhoods where it would be difficult to have it not right in front of the street? Like, do they have? Is the development in that neighborhood such that they have the ability to have their cans and whatever they have in their driveways, or is this a? Uh, is it all just because it, it would take it's just being put into the street? In, in answer to your question, I, I believe the if it was planned accordingly, like as an example. If you don't have a wide enough driveway that you can leave it, right? Don't pile all of your snow right where you're going to put your garbage cans on Thursday. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, if you were to push the snow back to the, like where the sidewalk is versus right by the curb line, you know, when you're clearing your snow, just make sure that, that we ask people to clear the fire hydrants and then stop and you have to clear the front walk to your house to get in. I mean, if you know your garbage cans, you have to go at the end of your driveway partway. I mean, when I lived on Old Mill, I used to shovel the the area in between the the houses in the in the duplex that I lived in, so that I could put my garbage can. No, I understand that. I was thinking more of I can think of, and I'm not saying this is where trash cans are on the street, but if I think of the, I don't know if the townhomes or duplexes in the Lakewood subdivision. Right, that's where it's prevalent. Where they have one car garages. And oftentimes they have cars that go out to the apron and they're sure. not blocking the sidewalk. So if you have vehicles that are there and you don't have enough space to put your trash can, where would they go with that? Put them on your parkway. If you look at the majority of people that put their garbage out in this community during the summer or whenever, they put it out on the parkway. They don't put it on your driveway. Right. I just didn't know if there are some things like that that when we're thinking about or talking to developers, right, mm -hmm. that these are things taken into consideration. I know we don't want them parking in the in the road during the winter. And so they end up doing some of the things like you're seeing where they're coming off the apron, you know, parking on the apron, mm -hmm. and they're getting creative because they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. And so I wasn't sure if this was one of those and how we as a village, when we're talking to future developers, how do we help to keep that in mind to avoid that type of, allowing that type of a. Uh, My trick has always been to take a look at, I tell them to go take a look at that, that area up in Lakewood and say, we don't want that again. It's like, I mean, I, I, not nothing against the residents, nothing against that neighborhood, but that that single car driveway or single car garage with no basement and a two car long single width driveway, it, it, it's a huge problem. Right. No, that's not towards the resident. At all. I, I was saying the residents, I think, could be trying to do everything that they can within their power and sometimes may not have an option. Right. I will say, I think some of these are newer residents who may not have been here long enough and they don't always know that we have you know an ordinance about not putting your cans in the street and maybe they did that in their previous communities and so they just don't know i know i have two new neighbors just on my block and both of them do it and it's right on a curve and mm -hmm. ooh, and i thought about just going over there and doing a neighborly knock but at the same time you know you don't want to be a busybody about it but would also like to prevent getting them you know a ticket and just pay it by the way yeah exactly so well, i just don't and i also don't want to be for your health sake at all you have a good yeah. point too i mean with the real estate market the way it is we have a ton of new residents mm -hmm. coming and going and so yeah. somehow finding a way to keep up communication of like did you know or right so you're aware of it or yeah usually, even if it's like a Post it now, so we can just walk up and stick it on the can. Yep, exactly. Can I ask a question of a few clarifications on that solar situation where representatives were presenting themselves as common age people? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I'm in the business, and that's an immediate dismissal thing with any company that does solar, and it can come right back to the state actually stopping the company from doing business mm -hmm. because of that, because the first thing they instruct us not to do is to do is to tell them we are not associated with ComEd or whoever the utility supplier is. So that's a that's a that's a no no in the industry. So that's really bad when that when that happens. And um, you know if, at least that's uh, what was reported. Yeah, yeah. Personally sure. interact with no, any of these individuals, but that's what we're doing. We were believed to be scammers. People coming right. in. There has been, it, it's not the first time, it's not the last time, but they look down very seriously on anybody that says they represent the ComEd or utility company for solar. Because 
they don't. That's why they have. They should be wearing identification. This is this is who I represent. But that's one of the first things we have to tell people we're not there on behalf of the utility company. So that's that's a really bad thing. Okay. So who does? So say that this gentleman comes to my house and says he's worked for Common Man, but he's selling solar. Who do I call to report that to? Electric guy. Nine one one. Nine one one. No, 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 no. I call to report yeah. the report the solicitor to nine one one. But who do I call to report the the business practice to? So, business um, if, if, if they have an ID for their company on it, well, they're not going to give it to me if they're saying we're going to report that. Yes, they should be doing. They should not be on your doorstep without an ID. So they should. So to clarify, to, in the village, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be coming. Period. So the the, yes. the patented uh, my green way of doing it is. Uh, I always ask to see their permit from the village, and then they say, "Oh well, I forgot it, or it's in my car." And then I always say, "Go." Oh, and it's like, "Well, it's a good story because the village doesn't issue permits." <laughs> and they say, "How do you know?" And then I go, "Well, I know somebody." And so then I then I promptly send them on their way and alert the authorities. So, but I tried to have a little call with them and get as much information that I had and then try to call the police, call the company, and then call the people. Let's go I just want to know who like a resident should call because obviously they're, they're going to scam you. So we, yeah. that needs to get reported. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but they're okay, going to tell the chief. Okay, we're, we're, we'll we'll get out of here. Sorry. A lot of these times in the summertime it's really bad because. These companies like the roofers, especially after storms yeah. and stuff like that, they get a bunch of college kids, throw them in a van, yeah. and then they go out and then they they disperse into the community. And that's when you know the, the police are running around chasing them because they'll get multiple calls in the targeted area, and it turns out they're a bunch of college kids that don't know any better. They're trying to make a few extra dollars. I mean, it happens. It happens all. But I don't know. This is the wrong time of year to be knocking on the door. So I mean, I, I don't understand what these guys are thinking. But, but if, if, if we become aware of somebody who is doing this, our company can report this, uh, if find out who the people are and report them uh, through our company and forward it to, to uh, people who will take action about this. But they can get in real serious problem. Can, can you find out? That. Can you find out from your company who would? Who they would report it to, so that maybe we can post it, yeah. and then this way it doesn't have to involve anybody else other than here's the phone number that they would report it to, and then we can give a lot of I assume it's like the state energy. Yeah, it, it's the Illinois has their various names. The Illinois Shines is one of the uh, controlling bodies for, for solar, and uh, okay. we step out of line in that area. Uh, I actually worked for a company back in 2018. That got prohibited from and actually got thrown out of Illinois because of uh, misrepresentation. So you're gonna you're gonna get that phone number and then we can do some kind of phone call. Find some information. Okay. Awesome, thank you. All right, Mr. Paulson, you're up. All right, thanks. Uh, it's kind of slow uh, on the engineering report, but uh, would note the connection water main project is out to bid. Bids will be due uh, next Tuesday, and then we'll evaluate those and be bringing a recommendation back to the board. Otherwise, if you have any questions. I, I, and maybe I just don't remember what the, the Stanley North one and the TRZ soft storage, and then it said, um, subdivision plat. Or wasn't that confusing? Where's that? Uh, they've s submitted a, a plat of subdivision that uh, we've reviewed. They've not resubmitted it. It's just to know. I mean, it's going to have to come to the board for approval of the uh, subdivision. But the TR storage. That's what I thought. Yeah. That's why I'm like, that's okay. So it's something bigger. Than, okay. That just confused Stanley, me. Stanley, I knew. North, Stanley North is what we call that industrial park. <laughs> okay. And the self storage is on the paths that they've already started pouring. That's what I knew. But then when it's a plan of subdivision, that's when I was confused. All right. <laughs> I got it. Anyone else? <laughs> no? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. You're welcome. We ask for a motion to approve the January 20, 2022 accounts payable to personnel for $40. Oh, well, I'll entertain that motion. 
But that in the building is right. So we have first and a second. So can I have a question for comments? Yes. Okay. Like I know. I saw that. All right. Uh, Ms. Clark? Mr. Matt. Ms. Matt? Aye. Ms. Palestini? Aye. Mr. Robinson? Aye. Ms. Golden? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Motion has six zero. Thank you. We've now asked for consideration of a motion to approve the January 2020-22 regular accounts payable in the amount of two hundred eighty thousand nine hundred sixty-three dollars and twenty-four cents. Any questions or comments? Sorry, yes. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve the accounts payable. Second. Now, any other questions or comments? Yes. There were so many the first time. Yes. So page um, 14 of this report, page 48, um, Trees Unlimited and it was for downtown snow removal for $4,500. Yeah, so um, the snow that's accumulated downtown is pushed over by the railroad tracks and uh, Trees Unlimited does that for us. Okay, so our guys don't do that. No, um, they use a big accumulator and at as you know, our loader is used for salt um, to put salt into the truck. So it's occupied essentially. So. We don't have enough personnel to do it. Okay. Okay. We just don't. I just saw snow moving like, What? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I will entertain a motion to approve the January 2020-22 uh, regular account payable as presented. Yes. Okay. Roll call, That's right. Roll call, please. Thank you, Ms. Clark, for keeping me on the game. Ms. Palestini. Aye. Mr. Robinson. Aye. Ms. Golden. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Matt. Aye. Motion passes zero. Mr. Kelly, you're up. Business Development Commission. Uh, Business Development Commission met last week. So we met last week. We discussed the the $250, as we discussed the $250 gaming fee uh, change. <laughs> We also discussed um, starting a project to work through what the mission of the BBC should be or, or is, and a, a potential transition from being seen as a BBC to more of an economic development commission. With the main difference as being discussed by the committee being in a business development commission, the focus was how do we bring business into Hampshire? How do we, how do we grow new businesses within an economic development commission? adding on top of that the responsibility of how do we help current businesses grow how do we help continue to drive success with current business owners or other forms of economic potential within the area and so um we're going to be kicking off a project to start working through what does that potential future look like and what could that committee be responsible for and and look to, towards focusing the time and effort on uh, and then the idea is once we've solidified that, to then also seek feedback from the village board. What do you think the committee should be focused on? Take that into it. All other stakeholders come up with a proposal to then bring back to the board to say, here's what, based on all the feedback we've heard and the research we've done and the discussions that the committee has had, here's what we'd like to propose as the focus going forward. Are you guys proposing a name change or not at the current time? That hasn't been discussed yet. No, the, re the only reason I ask is because uh, there's some publications and stuff that happen on a yearly basis, typically around May with the Chamber of Commerce and that kind of stuff. So I would say that I don't think that anybody would be opposed to a name change, but if we're going to change the name, you know, consider that sooner rather than later so that we, yeah, can, we can get it adjusted. We can have different pieces or phases accelerated outside of the main project, and that's fine. The one thing that I think we want to be thoughtful of is, you know, there was an example of, of how Algonquin is represented in it. And some of their stuff that, they, that their economic development looks at, as an example, is um, variances. Like they listed in their brochure things that have happened, a variance for the Walmart to be able to improve signage or for the Target to do improvements. That's all existing business, but it was something that they considered that they were part of that maybe they brought to zoning. I don't know what the process would have been. But those are some of the the changes in the purview. So that's why it's going to be a little bit more of a thoughtful process of what that should be. But I think the name change could be something that's separated from that larger. Just and, as and the reason the reason that that, uh, that was chosen, the Business Development Commission name was chosen was because at the time of the creation, there was an economic, economic development committee right. and there and there was some uh, pretty strong heads at the time and they didn't want to 
Right. They wanted to give distinct roles. And that was discussed that really they can they were combined and when they were combined it, it stayed as the BDC. So um it was also Mr. Hedges has brought up and as others did as well that many other communities do refer to their similar commissions as economic development commissions, not as BDCs. So I, I don't I don't want to speak for the commission, but I think that the name change would be something that they could discuss a lot. With Does anybody have any feedback or, or I don't want to say care, but does anyone have to, that's what, I want to have feelings one way or another if the name changes. I would just I, I would I would just say that if we're going to if you're going to go down that path, we should do that sooner rather than later for documentation purposes and stuff. Because we're gonna if, if we do move forward with the streetscape and stuff, we're gonna to want to push the work that you guys have done yeah. with that. And so I, we just want to make sure okay. Yes, yeah, so, and, and some of the discussion <clears throat> was, you know, and Mr. Hedges, if you'd like to expand on this, there were things of like Mr. Hedges having direction on if a business were to inquire about an open vacant piece of land, what is the strategy for that land? Is it is it something that the village saw in the long term being a certain type of use, and would that business fit that use? Or right now we really don't have that direction for a lot of the vacant land. But Mr. Hedges, do you want to? Yeah, the only thing I would clarify is I think the name is really incidental. I think the real the real objective is to develop a strategy, an economic development strategy for the village. And then we talked about how that strategy would evolve into the beginning of a new comprehensive plan that would reflect that strategy. So, and I, I would say that a name change will be the end of this process, which will take several months. Right. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't worry about the timing right now. Okay. Anything else to add to our questions? Anything I missed, Mr. Edges? No, the only thing I added for the end is uh, Josh and Lori and I have all been and to the mark. We've been working on the tip. Um, getting updated kind of where we are on the TIP uh, plan. As most of you know, we haven't had a meeting for several years. We had to get our financials caught up and the audits all caught up, which not, are not. Uh, so now we will be having a TIP meeting in the first quarter. And one of the things I wanted the BDC to realize is that improving the values of our properties downtown in the TIP area is really critical to the village. Um, as most of you know, we have a $300,000 deficit that the TIP owes the village. Um, we won't go into detail tonight. We will probably have a presentation for you sometime in the next uh, two months about where the tip stands, and then we'll be having a tip meeting soon. But it's really important. Uh, for example, the new um, the new Stanley East building will go into tax roll soon, and we now know that that will be assessed at roughly four million dollars market value. It's in the tip, and it'll generate thirty six thousand dollars per year to the tip, which will really help us retire those tip bonds. And those tip bonds are in. That's why we're running a deficit with the with the tip is because the village is having to pay those bonds instead of the tip. So we'll I'll have Lori go into much more detail about that. But the facade improvement program, for example, that adds value to those properties, and uh, it's really important that we keep our focus downtown and continue to improve the values downtown. Yeah, thank you for that. And the, um, any questions on the tip? There was one other thing I forgot. We also discussed the Main Street program, Main Street US program. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cope has is, is leading that effort, looking to put together a committee to really focus on the resources. There's a lot of great resources, and it was felt we could do a little more. Part of that discussion was to renew the membership, and that I think it was what three hundred dollars or something. So the commission and, and Mr. Hedges has that leeway to to make a purchase like that. So the decision was made to renew the main street, our membership in Main Street USA program. Some great information and dialogue on that too. So yeah, they had some Susie had some really good information about trends that are happening because of COVID and office space and that sort of thing. It's really really yeah, important. one on uh, physical retail becoming a order online pickup in person motion that she was reading about and that they were reporting. And so they do a bunch of research like that to figure out where's trends in business going that could really help, especially in the downtown area. How do we Target the right type of businesses to come in where we see the trend. Very interesting. Okay, Ms. Voter. The Public Relations Committee has a regularly scheduled meeting next Thursday, right here. Um, hoping that 6 30 is good. Looking for it now. Yeah, okay, 6 30. Fantastic. Mr. Coe, progress. Snow plowing, everything's going good. Ms. Costrini? Just a reminder that the budget committee has got the two dates set for February 23rd and March 9th. 
Okay, new business. Other announcements? Motion to adjourn. So, just, a, just one comment. I don't know whether anybody has been seeing out there. There is, uh, I spoke to several people who are using AT&T. There's a lot of scam going on at the moment on AT&T, where they are also telling people they can reduce their uh, phone off by considerable amount, and they need to purchase credit cards and pay it to the billing department at AT&T, and it's not their number. Check with AT and T and a couple of people in this Had me too, so I just wanted to make people aware of this. If you're an AT and T uh, subscriber for your phone, just be aware if you get something like that. Uh, it's telling you to greatly reduce your uh, your bills. I'm being very cautious. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Ms. Clerk. Ms. Boulder. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Cook. Aye. Mr. Brent. Aye. Ms. Ponsini. Aye. Mr. Allen. Aye. Motion to have zero. Thank you all.